talking to us and she's she's more focused on um, community work and she's also in charge of startup programs. I don't know if we have Chidera with us, but I will introduce her because she will be joining us in a minute. And Chidera is, her full name is Chidera Claire Ikeokonkwo, Ike and she's a data protection enthusiast, a legal practitioner and a regulator as well. So I just want to say a massive warm welcome to our distinguished, our distinguished panelists. So I think the most important thing right now is to give each and every one of them a chance to, 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 to really do the elevator pitch. Okay, Chidera just joined us. Welcome, welcome. I have already done your introduction, so no further introduction needed. So another big welcome to Nitta, NDPB, and Founder Institute, who will be joining us for this very enlightening conversation on is your business secure? Now, without further ado, I would like to give each organization led by their capable representatives a chance to do a presentation, a five minute presentation on their organization. After all, why are we here? We're here to learn more about these very important bodies. We're here to learn how we can keep our businesses secure. And don't forget, the buzzword is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. In order to have a more effective, sustainable business, especially with all the regulations flying around, you're going to need to learn to collaborate more with the regulators. You're going to need to work effectively in communities, startup ecosystems, etc. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Nitzda. I have Abdullahi and I have Fatima. I want to give you five minutes to please tell us a little bit more about Nitzda. What are the key things we need to know? And um, I'll, I'll give you five minutes. Thank you so much. Please, the floor is yours. Hi, Beverly. Um, I think I would like to call on my um, senior colleague Fatima to um, take over the mic and let us um, and, and give us a brief insight on NIPDA. Thank you so much. Please, Fatima, take over the mic and um, I know you'll do it justice, telling us a lot about your organization and the work you do within NIPDA. And then followed by NITDA, we will hear from the NDPB, the Nigerian Data Protection Bureau. And lastly, but not the least, we will hear from Precious John Adeyemi, Head of Partnerships at Founder Institute. Thank you. It seems that there might be a problem with Fatima's um, video. So I'm going to switch things up a little bit. Can I invite Chidera to give her presentation, if that's okay? Chidera, the floor is yours. If you can open up your video. Oh, Fatima is here. <laughs> okay, who is ready? <laughs> I've got Chidera, I've got Fatima. Oh, she's here now. Okay, let's, okay, Fatima, please, if it's okay, I will invite Fatima. Fatima, the floor is yours. But we can't hear you, so you might need to raise your volume. I can't actually hear. Can we hear Fatima? Fatima, we can't hear you at the moment, unfortunately. Hello? Oh, Can perfect. Yes, perfect, perfect. I okay. have to with my headphones. All right, okay. Yes. Thank okay. you so much. So you, you, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm Fatima Osman Mira from NITDA, and I'm part of the legal the part, the legal unit as well as the policy and research team of the Director General of NITDA. 
um, as we all know, NIDA is responsible for the development on um, regulation of information technology in Nigeria as mandated by our act of 2007. Um, one of our key um, mandates is to develop regulations for electronic governance and monitoring of use of information technology in Nigeria, um, private, both private and the public. And um, in order to promote SMEs, MSC, sorry, and startups, over the years, NIDA has developed various regulations and initiatives that have um, that have had a positive impact on some of on small and medium enterprises. Um, like for example, um, the establishment of the Office of the Nigerian Digital Innovation, which is the ONDI, even though um, not many people know about it. Um, this um, the the establishment deals with startups and MSCs by providing local and international market access and e-commerce digital skills development and supporting digital entrepreneurship. Um, these efforts help SMEs leverage digital technologies to enhance their competitiveness, drive growth, and contrib contribute to economic development in Nigeria. Um, we have so many initiatives, not just regulations, in order to drive this purpose. Earlier this year, if you might maybe be aware, um, um, startups were sponsored to participate at the LIPS Rocket for Pitch Competition in Riyadh, and two Nigerian startups won $300,000 each. Um, we also have Jitex, with co which comes in every year, and um, startups that apply and were picked get a full sponsorship to participate in all this um, over the globe. They get to experience so many things, um, um, also connect with so many business throughout the world, and most of our startups tend to do well. We win first prizes, second prizes, and um, um, yeah. So after, uh, apart from the initiatives as well and the capacity buildings that we do, we have, um, we have regulations as well. We have the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation, which is now known as the Nigerian Data Protection um, Bureau, which is also here. Um, it safeguards the rights of individuals in Nigeria with respect to data privacy, which in turn help um, SMEs protect their customers' data and build trust in their businesses. Um, there are also guidelines in, uh, in, um, in order to add, um, that promote this objective which is one of them is the Nigerian content development in ICT. Of what this does is um, it promotes local capacity. It mandates um, the public institutions to at least allocate some, um, some, some number of their contracts to, uh, um, to, uh, to, local, to local companies as well. Um, also, it also promotes, um, um, sorry, this, um, this guideline also encourages development of local capacity and use of local co uh, content, which in turn promotes local innovation, which was, that's what we're here for. Uh, we also have uh, recently, we introduced the service level, service level agreement for, um, for SMEs on the adoption of best practices for service level agreements. Um, we, we, we hope that it will help SMEs in the ICT sector provide quality services to their customers and avoid future disputes. Also, um, as you're aware, um, last year, yes, um, the Startup Act um, was, uh, has been passed into law and NIDA is the secretariat in charge with um, implementing this, um, this act. And uh, we, have our, uh, we have already um, started the implementation processes. And we hope that, uh, we believe that when this act is fully implemented, um, it will create an enabling environment that promotes innovation and entrepreneurship. It will provide incentives, support, and resources needed by startups. Um, but also, as an IT regulator, we know that we have to understand the uh, we understand the importance of engaging with stakeholders in the development of some of our not some of our, our regulations, all of our regulations. Um, therefore, we conduct stakeholder engagement. We do research, surveys, and collaborate with industry associations, such as the um, Information Technology Association of Nigeria and the Nigerian Computer Society, and so many others, to understand the challenges faced by SMEs in the ICT sector in Nigeria. We believe that um, collaboration with stakeholders is very, very crucial in addressing the digital challenges and issues faced by the SMEs. Um, one of the objectives of NIDAS regulations is to achieve maximum compliance and positive impact, because that's 
basically that's the objective of every initiative of all regulations. We want to ensure adoption of our policies and regulations. Therefore, we take various steps, including we do sensitizations, awareness campaigns, capacity building. We do collaboration with industry associations and incentives. And we also, sometimes we get incentives that to promote this. Um, we, uh, we believe that these steps will help ensure that stakeholders comply with the policies without even have to maybe bring in the hammer. If you involve them in, um, in making these regulations from the get-go, then they will own it. And then you don't have to even bother about compliance because it will just come naturally. And it will also help create an enabling environment for the growth of the ICT sector. Um, however, <laughs> I've been talking too much, sorry. Um, we recognize that more needs to be done, surely. Um, uh, uh, to ensure effective regulations and policy that truly benefit the industry. Therefore, NIDA um, has taken a deliberate approach um, to, uh, we are actively working on strategies to achieve a wider reach among our stakeholders and continue to improve our efforts in supporting the um, SMEs and the broader ICT ecosystem in Nigeria. So, um, I think I'll call, I have been talking so much, I'll call on my colleague to add one or, or two things. Thank you very much. I'm Thank so you, Fatima. Thank you. Lots and lots of detail there. Um, I'm sure people listening uh, will, will feel quite excited that, wow, there's NIDDA is, NIDDA is doing quite a lot to attract more of the startups uh, to empower um, the startup industry. So, you know, we're definitely going to get into some more questions because there's a whole lot of things you've mentioned that we want to know a little bit more about. I even see some questions. I, th I think I see a question already directed at NIDDA. So now I would like to ask Chidera, Claire, who is the head of innovation at the NDPB, the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau, to please um, say some words about about the NDPB, let's know about it and, and what, what strategies are they up to? Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I actually prepared a very short presentation that would help me to- um, That's fine. Better address, you know, what we do here at NDPB. I promise it's really short, it's just like- <laughs> That's fine. I will ask that you are given hosting rights so you can share your presentation. Thank you. Ola, kindly give her hosting rights so she can share her presentation. Thank you. Okay, so while, while we're waiting for the hosting rights to be exercised. Um, let me just start with um, some brief introduction. So like um, Beverly said, my name is Chidera Ikeokonko, and I'm the head of innovation at the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau. So the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau is a fairly recent um, creation of the federal government of Nigeria. Um, we are of, were popularly known as NDPB, and a lot of people, you know, confuse NDPB and NITDA, and it's understandable. That's because the law, or rather the regulation that we currently enforce, is a regulation that was um, formulated by NITDA as a subsidiary legislation to the NITDA Act. So we, um, according to international best practice, there was a decision to establish a bureau, you know, that would act as a data protection authority and administer the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. And so for all intents and purposes, NDPB is now a separate entity from NITSTA. And um, what we do may seem similar or identical in terms of you know, we're all about, uh, we're under the same ministry, that's the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy. And we're always talking about digital base and digital data and IT and all of that stuff. But um, our mandates are actually very different. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen right now. I'm still unable to share my screen.
Okay, I'm not sure why you can't share yet. Um, but uh, if you don't mind, just carry on with your presentation. And as soon as you can share, then you can carry on from there whilst I get that fixed. Thank you. All right, then. So um, the presentation I have here is titled The NDPR in a Nutshell, A Guide to Data Protection for SMEs. Um, my presentation starts with the objectives of the regulation. So remember I said we have a regulation that we currently enforce. It's called the NDPR, Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. So um, the objectives of the regulation are to safeguard the rights of natural persons to data privacy. So um, as we may have heard, um, data privacy rights are now um, on the same level as human rights. And so, you know, they are both equally enforceable and we are, um, we've been given the mandate to safeguard those rights. Uh, we also um, foster the safe, the safe conduct of transactions involving the exchange of personal data. Um, this particular point is really important because we live in a global age where, you know, data and information is being moved from one point to another at the speed of light. So um, that's why we're here. And then we also um, try to involve stakeholders to, um, to prevent the manipulation of personal data and to ensure that Nigerian businesses remain competitive in international trade through several safeguards that are afforded by um, the regulatory framework on data protection and privacy. Next, I want to talk about the scope of the regulation. So the regulation is actually um, precise in terms of its scope. It deals, it applies to all transactions that are intended for the processing of personal data. So I just want to draw our attention to the fact that what we what we are focused on is the processing of personal data. So we're not focusing on data on its own. It has to be personal data as a subset of that kind of data. And then that data must be processed or intended for processing. And it doesn't matter how processing is being conducted or intended to be conducted, as long as data is being processed. Um, secondly, the, uh, the regulation applies to all natural persons residing in Nigeria or outside Nigeria who are citizens of Nigeria. So what this means is that um, all residents of Nigeria, including citizens and non-citizens, um, you know, fall under the scope of the regulation, um, as well as businesses uh, that are operating in Nigeria, regardless of their nationality, they also fall under the scope of the regulation. And then Nigerians who are outside of Nigeria are also under the scope of the NDPR. Now, when we talk about processing of personal data, um, the processing of personal data should always be done lawfully. So I'm sure you're wondering, how can we process, how do we ensure that data is being processed lawfully? Well, we have five lawful um, grounds for processing personal data. The first one is something that we're all familiar with, which is consent. And consent is basically where a data subject, you know, has, has been informed about um, an intended data processing and has agreed to the terms of that processing of his or her personal data for one or more specific purposes. The second lawful basis is that the processing is necessary for the performance of a contract. Another lawful base is where the processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation. So for example, if you have organizations that are created by the federal government of Nigeria and have an, establishing, um, an, an establishment act, then we can say safely that when those kind of organizations process personal data, they're doing so um, in accordance with their legal obligation to do so. And then processing may be done in the vital interest of the data subject. It may also be done in the public interest. So public interest and vital interest are similar, but vital interest actually refers more to the data subject. And then public interest is usually in the exercise of an official public mandate, you know, vested in the controller. So the 
the processing that is done by federal government, you know, MDAs, for instance, you know, may be said to be done in public interest. Um, another thing to note is that when we talk about lawful processing, when we when we educate um, people about lawful processing, we always have to emphasize. I've mentioned five grounds for lawful processing, but actually, you only need at least one. A lot of businesses um, make make the wise decision of relying on more than one, but you need at least one. And so, I just want to, you know, make it clear that consent is not the only lawful basis for processing data. And next, we talk about the obligations of data controllers. So when it comes to the obligations of data controllers, the regulation is clear on three things. Number one, where the data processing is done by a third party. So what this means is that um, you may have a data controller and they are processing or they intend to process the personal data of some data subjects. They may not do this on their own. They may decide to involve a third party. But the law actually states that um, where the processing is done by a third party, then there should be a written contract between the third party and the data controller. And the whole Hi, point Chidera. of view, you can yes, share your I, screen. OK. All right, so let me do that now. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for that delay. Go ahead. Okay, so can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so um, I was talking about the obligations of data controllers, and I was saying that the regulation is very clear on the obligations of data controllers, especially when it comes to third party data processing. So I was explaining that where the processing, uh, the intended processing is going to be done by a third party other than the um, data controller, there has to be a written contract between the third party and the data controller. So what we do as regulators is to um, bring this you know, regulation, this part of the regulation, these obligations to the attention of data controllers as a means of safeguarding the rights of data subjects. Another obligation of data controllers is data security. And in a nutshell, it just says that the, the data controller must implement technical and organizational methods or measures to ensure the security, integrity, and confidentiality of personal data. So what this means is that we recognize that data controllers are actually in possession of a huge amount of personal data. And this personal data should not be processed without taking into consideration some technical and organizational measures to ensure that that data that they are processing is actually kept safe and private. So when I talk about technical measures, these are things like setting up firewalls, um, how you store the data, encryption, and you know all of that stuff. And then organizational methods actually refer to things like your policies. So we advise um, data controllers on their policy, you know, in-house for handling personal data, for transferring personal data, um, for identifying sensitive or confidential data, as well as continuous capacity building for the staff. Thirdly, we have data breach reporting. So the regulation stipulates that data controllers have a duty to self-report data breaches within 72 hours. And the 72 hours starts to count from the time that they have knowledge of the breach. And so the expectation is that once they have um, knowledge of the breach, they're expected to report the breach to the NDPB. And um, I would actually advise or encourage you to actually look at the NDPR itself, that's the regulation. And you can find the regulation on NDPB website, ndpb.gov.sg. 
NG and it's under the um, tab that's called resources. So you can download the regulation. It's just about 20 pages. It's actually, you know, simple, straight to the point. So you can now see more about what these obligations actually entail, especially for an SME. Next, we talk about NDPR compliance. So there are basically four things that we um, advise data controllers to do in order to exhibit compliance with the NDPR. So it is not enough for them to say, we know about the NDPR. They need to show um, overt actions, right? That they are actually doing things according to the regulation. And the first one is that data controllers need to have data protection policies. This also includes privacy policies. It must be on their website. It must be documented. It must be, um, you know, people in the organization must be aware of it. And it has to be reviewed from time to time. And even the contents of these policies have to be in line with the regulation. Secondly, every data controller is expected to designate a data protection officer. So a data protection officer is a person within an organization that has, you can identify the person from you know, their work ethic or their job description and think to yourself, oh, this person is going to be a good fit to be a data protection officer. And when such people are identified, the next step is to um, you know, put it in writing, document it, and then send it to the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau saying, these are the people that we have nominated as our data protection officer. The reason why we expect this is so that we can have a point of contact between the bureau and the stakeholder, in this case now, an SME, so that if anything goes wrong or if we have trainings, webinars, or other resources that we think that um, the data controllers will benefit from, we can easily have someone to call and you know, exchange information with. Also, if, if, it's, if it's impracticable to get a DPO in-house, it is possible to outsource the job of a DPO to a competent firm or person. Usually, we, we at the Nigeria Data Protection um, Bureau license entities that we call DPCOs. So a DPCO is a data protection compliance organization. These DPCOs are actually licensed by the Bureau. And we, when we license them, the expectation is that they help data controllers to ensure that they are complying with the NDPR, that is the regulation. And one of the major things that DPCOs do, apart from offering DPO as a service, another thing they do is that they help the organization to conduct what is called an NDPR audit. So this compliance audit is, there's more detail in the implementation framework, but what they are looking out for is not your, they're not looking for your data. They don't care what kind of data you have. All they look at is your data processing um, procedures and you know, how, how does it work? What are you, are you doing it right? Are you using the lawful basis? Are you, you know, um, violating rights? Is, your, is the privacy of the data subjects actually being guaranteed in all your processes? So that's what they do. And after this audit has been done, they are expected to file this audit with the Bureau. And this audit is expected to be filed every year by 15th of March of the following year. So um, that's about it for the NDPR compliance. Next, we have data subject rights. So if you look at the regulation, you will find that the data subject rights are more explained in detail. But here I have um, condensed it to seven points. So the first right is the right to be informed. Of course, you need to let the data subject know that you're collecting that data and what you're using it for. And then you have the right of access. They need to be able to access this personal data when they need it. Rectification, like the name implies, if there's a mistake, it should be, you should allow them 
to rectify it, even if it's if it if it is at a reasonable fee or they have to follow a procedure. But these rights cannot be neglected. Um, there's also the right to erasure, which basically means you know if they decide I want to I want you to forget about me, then that's where the right to erasure comes in. Um, there's also the right to data portability, which is currently being developed. Basically, it allows for interoperability of um, personal data between various data controllers. And then we have they also have the right to restrict processing. So this right to restrict processing is what we often see when you get an email and you keep getting emails from a particular organization. And at the point, you want to opt out from getting those emails. So by providing the option of letting the um, customer or the data subject unsubscribe. That is another. That is one way to enforce the right to processing of personal data. We also have the right to. They also have the right to withdraw consent at any time. So again, consent very important. You know, um, just as consent can be freely given, it should also be able to be freely taken away. So you can't take away the choice from the data subject. And then in case you know an SME decides that they want to transfer data to a foreign country or an international organization, or you want to share that data or otherwise make that data available to a foreign country or an international organization, the NDPR actually provides conditions as well as exemptions on the issue of cross-border data transfer. Um, I don't want to say too much. I'm going to provide the slides to the host um, at the end of this webinar, just so that you can go through it. And then also we have resources on our website and you can read more about these conditions. Then very importantly, penalties. We would be seen as a toothless bulldog if we did not have penalties. This is one of the ways that we enforce this regulation. And so the NDPR provides that any person who is subject to the regulation and is found to be in breach of data privacy rights is liable to a penalty of either 2% of their annual gross revenue or 10 million naira, whichever is greater. And this category of penalty actually applies to data controllers that are you know, of major significance who are are processing the personal data of more than 10,000 subjects. But when the, um, the organization is processing the data of less than 10,000 data subjects, then the fine is 1% of the annual gross revenue or 2 million naira, whichever is greater. And we get this a lot of people say, oh, but we never hear about these penalties. Um, to that, I think my response would be, we do give out these penalties. Um, it's actually documented, although because of the sensitivity of the cases, you know, sometimes it's not um, gazetted as it should be, but these penalties actually do apply and um, they apply in a variety of situations as long as it involves data privacy breach. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm looking forward to lots of questions and you know, a meaningful interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Extremely detailed. And I see so many questions already in the Q&A. So um, really, really good. Um, I think it's going to get lots of people interested and hopefully we'll have a lot of interactive conversation. Now, last but not the least, I would like to invite Precious John Adeyemi of Founder Institute to give her presentation. And then after that, we can go into the more interactive session where I ask questions. And then afterwards, we're gonna open up the floor to the audience to, to, to directly ask their questions and also to answer some of the questions that have already been put in the chat. Okay, Precious, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Thank you very much. And am I audible? Can everyone hear me?
Hello, hi Pepe, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much, Chidera. Um, thank you to Chidera and um Fatima for that wonderful presentation. Quite a lot to learn, and again, it speaks to events just to learn what regulators are doing to ensure that um. Hi, Precious. You want to just raise your voice a bit so you're more audible? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Am I loud enough now? Much better. Thank you. Okay, great. So I was just thanking Chidera and Fatima for great work on just giving us more knowledge on what is that and and Chidera for obviously breaking down um the answer and just giving us more. So um my name is Precious Jonathan and I lead partnership and community management at uh, Founder Institute is the world's most problem that fund ideas into fundable startups and startup startups. I focus at the retail and we work with startups at the earliest with the idea stage and the first helping them support their business. Um, and get started. Um, globally, we have been to over 200 countries around the world and um, 200 cities around the world. Too. And um, our alumni have um, raised over $1.7 billion in funding and have an estimated worth of um, our, our, our program is community decision, where we have mentors, we have a global network of mentors, partners and um, founders, thereby creating a relationship And over the course of that time, we have a and um, help them to back. And after two programs are having, and to every program, And we possibly get to and look at life so not just in but the meeting to have comment who have obviously obviously built yeah in Africa and they train us every week and found that that's true for us um program found that or of their company. Sorry, that the founders are compliant towards Nigeria as the companies and as well. Um, our alumni um, have been able to raise funding, and we are currently in the bottom of the graph. And um, we have the most uh, amazing, exciting community. And that's basically the founders we do. Yeah, our website got quite by if I do learn more about the program and what we do mentors and partners. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, precious. I really appreciate it. You kept it nice, you kept it short and sweet. Okay, so now I think it's time to get into the Q&A session, um, which everybody's been pretty much been waiting for. I don't want to dwell too much on my personal question because the truth is this was set up mostly to for the benefit of, um, you know, the, the stakeholders. So I'm just going to jump right into uh, the Q&A chat that I see um, up. So let me just go through some of these questions. I have one here for Nitta. It says, what are the requirements for NITDA's NDPR? Do small companies need to comply with NITDA, with the NITDA, and how can that be done? So I guess directing this to Fatima, you know, I, I, was, in a, I was in a webinar once, I was on a panel once, and I remember saying regulations are not and uh, regulations are not according to your size. Regulations are based on your function. So it's really about getting people to understand once your business 
is in a certain type of function, no matter your size, you are captured. So maybe you want to just elaborate on that bit more for us, Fatima. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You've basically said it all. So for the first question about, he said, sorry, let me, what are the requirements for NIDAS and DPR? Well, there's uh, NIDAS NDPR is NDPB's NDPR is the same NDPR. They just moved from NIDA, so now they have now their own organization called National um, Data Protection Bureau. So there's no NIDAS NDPR. You just have to comply with the uh, requirements set out by NDPB. That's all. And then um, for the second one, the small companies need to comply with the NIDA registration process. As long as you are an SME or you are a company that under um, under our own industry, you just have to comply. You have to register, and also you know it's a requirement if you want to have like um, to get um, government contracts as it relates to ICT. You have to provide a registration um, document. So I would just um, advise you to do that as soon as possible, not to wait till when you are um, you are in need you to because you know it's a process. So just apply, it doesn't take time, it doesn't cost money, just apply and get your registration in order. That's it, thank you. And if you need more, uh, more clarification, you can always forward it to our emails and we'll be happy to respond to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fatima, thank you, thank you. I'm just going to check for more questions. I guess one other question I might ask is, um, are the registrations different depending on your size? Okay, I see Chidera has, <laughs> Chidera wants to chime in. All right, Chidera, okay. please, you're welcome. So um, I like what Fatima said, um, NDPR no longer, it's no, it's no longer NIDA's NDPR, it's now NDPB's NDPR. Even though, like I said in my presentation, NIDA was the one who came up with the regulation. So they came up with the regulation because there was no agency at the time in 2019 that was designated to do it. Like the, the agency that had the nearest uh, mandate to do that was NITDA at the time. But over time, you know, by international convention, it became clear that you couldn't have NITDA who is by their function a data controller actually administering a data protection regulation. It is like, um, I don't know how to put it, but it's like me, you know, I mean, I play in the field. Okay, so it's like the referee being one of the players on one of the teams. So it doesn't work like that. There has to be some sort of independence. So the NDPR is now administered by the NDPB. And then when it comes to registration, Currently, we do not expect data controllers or data processors to register. What we expect is for you to forward the list of your DPOs, so the list of your data protection officer. You would forward it to the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau, as well as meet all the other requirements. So there is no registration right now. I'm just going to add that in the new or rather in the upcoming data protection bill, there is a requirement for registration, but we do not have that bill yet. The bill is still a bill, it's not yet an act. So it is not yet in force. So right now there is no need to register with NDPB. All you need to do is to, like I said in the presentation, meet the compliance requirements. Now, when it comes to this issue of small companies, Yes, small and medium enterprises. For us, like Beverly said, it's about the function. Whether you're a small or medium enterprise, are you a data controller? What is a data controller or a data processor? If your business is done, if your business is done by, you know, processing personal data, that means um, I don't know what it is, but if you have to collect people's names, email, phone number, their personally identifiable information, if you have to use that as part of you know 
whatever it is you're running your business, however it is you're running your business, then you are a data controller or a data processor. And as such, you have to comply with the regulation. The NDPR actually makes special provisions for companies that are processing the personal data, um, personal data in the amount of 1,000 personal data in a year. So there are only, you're just a new business, you're small, you're medium, but it's just 1,000 customers maybe that you're processing their data. That's all well and good. But the NDPR actually provides that even if you're a small, medium enterprise, you're just you know, processing just about 1,000 you know, personal data, you still need to comply. The reason is simple. Whenever you're dealing with personal data, there is always a risk attached. And we are here to help you to manage those risks. And the major risk you run is breach of data privacy or data protection rights. Now, even if I were just handling the personal data of Beverly, I'm expected to handle it with such care to make sure that I do not violate her um, rights as a data subject. So the same thing applies to other organizations, regardless of the size. I hope this answers your question. Um, yes, it, yeah. it does. Oh, Fatima, oh, please go on. Sounded, yeah, um, thank you very much, Jira, for that clarity, because when I saw the second question, what just rung in my head, because he said NIDA registration process was IT clearance. So I think um, I uh, misunderstood the question, but thank you very much for the clarity. Okay. So just to bring this very practically, we're talking about function. We're talking about startups that could potentially be engaged in data processing. And, and you know, right now we have a lot of startups, creatives who are into the business of say, um, maybe they're a ticket platform, they sell tickets for concerts. Uh, maybe they are, um, they are um, a cultural, they, 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 they run cultural, cultural tourism. Tourism is also growing. Um, so I think people need also a bit of clarity on, you know, what, what types of businesses, can you give us some examples of, you know, the kind of businesses, regardless of size that you're seeing that are, that are, that fall under the, the, the ambit of the NDPR? Is the question directed to me? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so let me see. So we can start with places like banks, hospitals, schools, um, online vendors. So you go online, you need to buy something and you know something pops up and says, please enter your email address because we need to deliver it to you. So online shopping platforms. Um, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, um, Snapchat, um, MTN, Globacom, Airtel. I know I'm calling all the big businesses, but my intention is that by mentioning the ones, you can find the smaller ones that are sort of similar. Um, microfinance banks, um, basically in a nutshell, if the business requests a human being, to surrender their personal details, such as their name, phone number, email address, your age, um, your gender, any of that kind of stuff, then that is a data controller or a data processor. Okay, and you know, I, I had to ask this question expressly because the truth of the matter is many, many of us are caught by this. So it's really to showcase that this is just not for the big banks or the big companies. It affects 99% of us, truth be told. <laughs> so I just wanted to, to make that clear. Now, I just want to, there's another question here that says, how many DPCOs do we currently have in Nigeria? How many DPCOs do we currently have in Nigeria? So the, the, who is, okay. So we currently have 153 DPCOs in Nigeria. And you can find a list of all the licensed DPCOs in Nigeria on our website, ndpb.gov.ng. So if you need the services of any DPCO, you can check 
the websites. Okay, brilliant. And um, I, there's another question here that says, I heard that the period to file the NDPR audit has been extended to the second quarter of this year. How true is this, please? Okay, so the extension is actually until the 30th of June this year, and it's just for this year. So um, before now, people usually expect that, you know, when the deadline reaches, we would automatically extend it. But we have noticed that it actually um, defeats the entire purpose. So let me explain. You start business at a particular time of the year, and then you count, you know, one year, according to your business, it may start in January or you start counting at whatever time of the month um, of the year, rather. And then you can count 12 calendar months since you've been doing business. The expectation of the NDPR is that within that one year, you're able to audit your data processing activities so that you can see what you are doing right and see what you're not doing well and know how to remediate and you know, basically plug those gaps. If we keep extending the dates, what will happen is that you will have people that have a, a period of more than 12 calendar months and they are filing their audits within that period. You know? And it doesn't help a data controller or a data processor to be accountable for the data that they are processing because the benchmark or the hallmark of the NDPR is um, creating accountability on the part of the data controllers. And so that's why I said for this year, it has been extended to the 30th of June, but for next year, we will still reinforce the original date, which is 15th of March, and we may not have an extension. I hope my explanation was adequate. Thank you. And I have a question now directed to Fatima. As, as the assistant manager in legal at, at NIDA, one of the things you talked about in your, in your presentation was a lot of initiatives that NIDA is working on by to enable and support the, you know, the, the SMEs, startups, for the benefit of people in this audience who could be they could be startups themselves, founders. They could be lawyers who have clients that are startups. What would be your advice to any SME startup that really wants to plug into the work NIDA is doing? You know, where, where, what, 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 what should they, how should they prepare themselves infrastructurally, um, digitally? What, how should any serious founder be positioning itself right now to take advantage of the work that NIDA is currently doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my advice will be us um, to read our regulations first because Nigeria, we don't like to read. Like things are there That's at, true. Our fingertips, That's true. at our fingertips, but we don't like to read. So um, just pick up maybe, let's start with the Startup Act which is now will be like the foundation of all startups um, for you to get grants, for you to get support, um, for you to even get capacity building. Get that act, read it true and true. And then maybe, and also um, uh, one of the things, um, the direction we are going on in NIDA now is seeing um, the potentials of the emerging technologies. So if you are into, um, let's see, if you are into, um, what, what was the stamp? Um, maybe you can, um, like now we're, we're focusing on things of blockchain. We just uh, recently um, finished a policy on blockchain policy. We had uh, some of, uh, we have stakeholder engagement yesterday with some of our um, stakeholders, uh, public stakeholders to see how we are going to further enrich that document. And also um, of recent, we launched something called um, the intelligence framework in the agency. This framework is going to tailor our activities, is going to 
um, tell us how we are going to communicate with our stakeholders. So as of right now, we're trying to build networks of stakeholders, of um, industry researchers, academics, whatever you do, as long as it relates to the ICT sector, um, you can always write to us, give us maybe a, uh, um, an, uh, an overview of what you do. And if it falls in any of the direction we are going, because as of right now, we're focusing our team in the agency is market creation. Whatever we're doing, we have to make sure that it's going to create a market so that the industry will continue to grow. And then we are going. Uh, we are looking at consumer protection. We are looking at um, innovation, and we are looking at um, improving service delivery. So, if you have any ideas that is going to connect into these four themes, it will be a very great um, um, effort of your uh, on your side to actually maybe write something about it. You can send it through Netda or Onda. Anyone is fine, but maybe send it through Netda. We'll take a look at it. If this fits into um, some of the things that we're focusing on, we'll channel it to the right um, department or team that is um, in charge of that, um, um, that is in charge of that, what is it called? <laughs> I'm lost of what it's it okay, is. it happens, yeah. it happens. We understand, <laughs> we get the flow, yeah. okay. Yeah, so just study our regulations, follow on that, you can follow on that for you to be able to benefit on all this um, foreign trips, um, foreign sponsorship because now the registration for JITEX has just opened. So you can go through their, um, their website, see um, what they are focused on and just register. And if you are lucky, if you are lucky, um, your, um, your innovative idea is what we are looking um, past the threshold, then fine and good, you get your full scholarship and we'll see you in Dubai. <laughs> that sounds amazing, that. okay. Yeah. yeah, so just follow our, you can follow Ankai, follow on there, all our subsidiaries, because we have each subsidiary in charge of a certain thing. If you are hands-on, maybe into robotics, follow Enkai, and then you see all their activities, you'll be able to chip in and see what benefits you at the end of the day, when it does it. And if you have any idea, we operate open door policy. You can walk in, ask for any, um, ask for, uh, to speak with the, if um, we have SA Digital Innovation, you can ask to speak with him, maybe channel your ideas. Um, if it's something that we are good, um, we have interest in, then we'll take it over from there. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you have more questions, you can forward them. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you for answering that very well and extensively. Um, I have another question. I think this one is directed to Chidera because it, it talks about the licensing requirements to become a DPCO. Would you like to take that? How does, how does an organization become a DPCO? Okay. So as a forward thinking and very um, modern um, MDA, we actually have a very, very responsive website. We also have a dedicated hotline. If you go to our website, you will see where it states in details the process to become ADPCO. Let me just, you know, let you know that the window for applying to be a DPCO is currently closed. Um, earlier in the year, or I think towards the end of last year, we opened the um, portal for registration of new DPCOs. And we received an almost overwhelming application for, you know, of new DPCOs. Previously, we had about 74. Now we have 153. And the National Commissioner thinks that it is enough. And I'm inclined to agree with him because we have to um, monitor and test the integrity of the ecosystem. So unfortunately for now, um, the regime for licensing of DPCO has been closed until further notice. But if you're still interested in knowing the process, perhaps you're very hopeful and you want to start making plans in advice in advance, please check our website. Um, all the information that you need to know is right there. And if for any reason you still need to, you know, speak to someone at the bottom of the page, you will see our contact details. You can call the number and someone will speak to you. You can even request to speak to me personally if you want. That's totally fine. So that's it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Always, always um, very helpful and explanatory. Yeah, I, I mean, you ladies have been very, very um, supportive, you know, and, and this is what we're trying to showcase, that the regulators want to work hand in hand with the stakeholders. For me, the buzzword has been collaboration. I've been hearing this buzzword for nearly five months and it's really coming, it's really proving, um, you know, from the quality of the discussions, from the way the questions are being answered that we're, re we're really in a new era and definitely the stakeholders, everybody has a role to play in, in making sure, in, in ensuring the success of, of, um, of the ecosystem. So the regulators played their part, but we uh, on the private sector also have to play our part. I think one question I would like to also get in, and this would be directed at both of you, so I'll take it in turn, is, um, you know, what data protection is, is it, it's been around for a long time. It's not new really, but um, we seem to hear more of um, data protection breaches and, and data protection incidents from abroad. You know, you hear of, uh, you know, all these global brands that we're very familiar with, Meta, all the big brands will hear, ah, they were fined. Even Uber, I think I heard of a fine. Now, fines have been traditionally used to deter to deter, um, um, you know, um, malfeasance, undesirable behavior. So I guess my question to the both, to, to both, I'll start with Nitta, is um, how, apart from penalties, which we need, what are the ways, what are the strategies is Nitta using to encourage um, SMEs to develop better practices. What 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 advisories does NITDA put out? Is it easy to find your advisories, your policies, your guidelines? Um, but you know, a, a word of advice generally for the members of the audience on um, you know what 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 should SMEs be doing to secure their data from you know from abuse. Etc. And now to come over to Chidera. Okay, um, I'll start with the question on the strategies we take um, uh, uh, instead of fines. Um, so um, basically, you know, um, data protection is not with us anymore. So we don't really uh, indulge into that. Um, it's just that if they need support, we're always there to lend a hand. So, but um, based on the compliance of some of our regulations and initiatives, um, um, earlier I spoke about the intelligence framework. So inside that intelligence framework, another strategy that we adopted now is that we have a stage by stage of compliance. So if we have like, if we have uh, um, people that are complying, then what do you do to them? Are you going to find oh, what's the right approach to them? So we discovered that if we have people that are willingly complying, is maybe educate them for that, um, maybe try to support them, give them some incentives. And then there are also a class of people that are actually comply without knowing that they are complying. So what we do with those um, um, category is that we educate them basically. We do sensitizations, we do training so that they, 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 they get to know the importance of that compliance. And then there are some people that are not compliant without knowing that they are not complying. That category as well, we try to educate them, we try to show them um, the benefits of, of following this um, regulation and also the repercussion of not following it. Then there are some people as well that are very, very tricky. They are aware of the um, they are aware of the regulations. They are aware of the um, they are aware of the repercussion, but they found a way to actually sneak behind the regulation and just um, uh, ride ride on the fact that the the new Nigeria we don't really like to implement our policy. We like to make policy a lot of them, but implementation is the major challenge. So what we do with that is that we now said okay, we are going to start with. Um, warning letters, then we're going to also educate them as well and see, let them tell us the actual reason why they are not complying. Maybe um, the, uh, if they are that smart to actually go behind that regulation, then maybe there's a re uh, we can sit down with them 
there's a way that we can improve our policies or our regulation or that particular initiative. And then if we do all these things and still they don't comply, then I'm sorry, we just have to come with the hammer <laughs> because the people are just habitual. They just don't want to comply. But um, uh, we are actually being deliberate about trying to uh, uh, um, uh, put a, um, uh, warning, uh, uh, punishing people to uh, to be the last resort. It will be the last resort. Um, we just implemented the um, the framework this early this year, and we are doing socialization in, uh, for the in order for the agency to actually try and change its culture, so that moving forward, we we'll always try to see how we can incentivize people to actually follow our regulations. That's why from the beginning, what we are going to be doing now is that if we have any regulation, if we have any initiative, we're going to sit down with the stakeholders from the beginning, from with the idea down, try to build up that idea so that you'll be able to own that idea. Then we won't have to have any issue with enforcement because all the stakeholder from the initiative, from the initiative, uh, from the initial stage, see the initiative of these um, initiatives and um, regulations, then they will know that for the benefits uh, of their own businesses and they will willingly comply. So I think that's it. And then for the fact that um, um, the advice on following regulations as regards to um, data privacy, please just comply. <laughs> comply. <laughs> comply, comply. Comply, comply, comply. Because um, we're not here to trick anyone or to um, disadvantage anybody. If SMEs work and they progress, it's the benefit of the whole Nigeria and the nation at large. Everyone will benefit. So Absolutely. If you, have, yeah, if you have any concern as it relates to a regulation, just write it down. Send it to the um, agency or the organization that is in charge. I'm telling you, for my own organization, we actually go through it. And so many of our regulations as of now are going through review, thorough review. And the okay. industry is going to be aware of it based on our networks. We're going to sit down and see how we're going to make it better. So whoever wants to be in our network, you can forward maybe your um, details to um, to um, Beverly. And then Beverly, that's fine. Yes. And then okay, okay. So everybody, you've heard Fatima has has put it out there. It's a it's a it's a collaborative process and exercise. Um, no one is going to be allowed to sit and complain in their corner. It's this is the time to play a a, a proactive role in even policy policies that you don't understand that may not be working for you. Send the send the send the suggestion. Send the feedback. You know it's it's important that uh, the the private sector really does play its part in helping to drive these much needed changes and innovation. We've seen what's happened with the Startup Act. We've seen that it was such a wonderful collaborative exercise between so many different uh, sides of the ecosystem. So with data protection now, you know we've got knit down one end. Um, um, you know, looking more closely at the ICT, at the technology, we've got NDPB looking more closely at the regulation and I suppose the implementation. So we've got these two bodies that, you know, are, are working on different aspects of data protection. So, you know, it's an open door policy, like they've said as well, you know, get in touch. I think somebody in the Q&A said, is it possible to visit the uh, NDPB office in Lagos. I would let uh, Chidera answer that. Is it possible to visit? Fatima has confirmed you can send a mail. Um, if you live in, Ab if you're in Abuja, maybe you can visit them. But uh, Chidera, do you want to confirm if, if, if you can get, if you can be visited? So yes, you can definitely visit us. Although we encourage you to call and send in emails. Okay. We're trying to we're trying to be forward thinking, okay? And gone are the days where people think if you need a service from a government institution, you need to come all the way to Abuja and then you know book an appointment and speak to a rude secretary 
who will tell you to sit down and you wait and wait and go upstairs and come downstairs and not, we don't do that any longer. So now you can reach us on WhatsApp. Um, sorry, you can reach us on, you can actually reach us on WhatsApp because our number actually is attached to WhatsApp, but you can always call, you know, put um, a phone call through, send an email. You can send us a DM on Twitter, on Instagram, or Facebook. I mean, that is how we um, expect to collaborate with everybody in the ecosystem. I believe everybody's on social media now. So we're also on social media and our social media accounts are very responsive. So instead of coming to the office, save yourself the stress, just call us. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I mean, we're coming so pretty much to... Yeah. Sorry, so, did oh, I, I think you wanted me to speak to the enforcement. How we yes, work. please. I want you to speak to that before okay. we wrap up. So just, just very briefly, like I said earlier, we were established in um, 2021. We actually just celebrated our first anniversary, you know, of, you know, um, of being in existence in Nigeria. So... It is not our intention to come out straight and start pursuing everybody and say, you have to comply or we'll give you a fine. We need to give the ecosystem time to settle, right? We, we're trying to shake things up, but at the same time, we're trying to, we're trying not to stifle businesses. So we're not coming in, we, we're, we're adopting the carrot and stick approach. Now the carrot approach is basically it's good for you and it's good for us, right? So um, a lot of times because of globalization, you know, everybody's doing business online. So you can be doing business with someone in another part of the world. Because of that, we, we've seen or we've observed that um, there's this adequacy requirements from other foreign countries. So if you want to do business in, in the UK, for instance, in Europe, right, coming from another country, the first thing they are going to want to know is if we're dealing with personal data, do you have a data protection authority? Do you have data protection laws? So if you're going to do business and you're hoping to cash out from that business and you get to the conference room or the Zoom meeting and they are talking about compliance and you don't have anything to exhibit for compliance, they're not going to take you seriously. And so that's the current approach. And we're doing this by massively sensitizing the public. And we live in a country of almost 200 million people. It is a tall order, but we are by God's grace equal to the task, right? And so we're taking it step by step, one day at a time. We're just one year old. I mean, what do you expect from a one year old child if you think about it? You know, but we've made a lot of <laughs> we've made a lot of modest achievements in the short time that we've been around, you know. And so we're hoping to solidify that. And then when we talk about the stick approach, the stick approach, we usually tend to use that for data controllers that have been in the ecosystem. So there are some classes of um, data controllers that they've been there right from time. Take, for example, banks. They are heavily regulated. You have banks as old as Nigeria itself. So when you find that these banks who ought to know better are slacking and letting things slip through the cracks, then we have to come with the stick approach. For those guys, you cannot use the carrot approach. They already know better, right? And so we use the stick approach. And I'm sure, I don't know if you've heard, but you know, recently we have issued a couple of fines against some banks, you know, because we get reports from the public about data um, privacy breaches or data breaches. And then when we start doing the investigation and you start, you just pull on one thread and everything unravels. And so we have issued fines, you know, especially in that banking um, sector as it were. So that is our approach right now. So for SMEs, um, it is not our, it's not one of, it's not in our plans to actually come knocking on the door and saying, you have to comply. First of all, we understand that these are small and medium businesses. We understand the logistics of everything. And we actually want the ecosystem to grow, right? We don't want to stifle it. And so we will continue to do, you know, massive sensitization. 
the, our national commissioner will always say, as long as we exist, we will always do two things. We will create awareness and we will improve capacity. So awareness creation and capacity development is something that we've been doing since we started and we are not going to stop anytime now. So that's, that's our current approach. Thank you, thank you. And I mean, I, I would say that even this webinar is a form of awareness. It's a form of awareness. People have, have, have had some questions answered that they weren't sure of. And, and it's great to know that they, can, that they can reach out via mail or they can you know, call ahead if they really want to come visit you at your offices. I, I really want to say a very big thank you for making out this time. Honestly, no, it's not easy. Like you said, it's a tall order, you know, um, NITDA and NDPB. There's a lot going on. There's a lot you're managing. There's a lot you're leading. And at the same time, you're responsible for all the stakeholders as well. So, you know, like I, like I, like I want to emphasize, it's a collaborative process. The days of private sector sitting back with arms folded, just waiting to see is over. Those who are tr the, the, the private sector um, players and operators that are truly successful are the ones who actually reach out to the, to the regulators. It's, it's no longer, oh, we're just going to hide and hope that they don't notice us. No, the ones that are successful really go out there and ask the right questions. You know, they create the liaisons, the networks. And, and Nitda, uh, Fatima has already mentioned that there's a, a sort of uh, round table that um, they are starting, you know, comprised of various stakeholders. If, if you have anything interesting, you want to share any innovations, you're free to, to, to share your, your ideas. You're free to, you know, engage. Engagement is really what, what this has been about. So I think I just want to ask for, you know, your final words, your final words of advice uh, on this webinar before we close off officially. So I'll go back to Fatima and then I'll end with you, Chidera and Precious. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. This is actually my first webinar. <laughs> wow, great. <Yeah. laughs> so I'm very, very excited. Thank you very much. And I will just advise that please let's endeavor to read, 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 read. If you see like um, a document um, being brought, just, just say, ah, they have come again. Open it and see the opportunities that you can salvage from that document. And then um, also follow us, follow our subsidiary announcements. We're on all the social media handles, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. Um, you can also, we have our um, communication um, channels on our website. You can send emails. You can call us. I can drop my email address if you need any um, um, any information. You can always contact me, and you can also walk into our office and just ask your questions. And I believe you get um, the results. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm glad. I'm glad you made it. I'm gonna um, go to Precious now to share some of her lasting comments. Um, thank you, Beverly. Thank you um, to Chidera and um, Fatima. I really learned a lot listening to both of you. Um, okay, I'm just saying I was not visible. What I will say is for, I know I can have a lot of um, founders, at least SME business owners in the room. What I will say is um, I know quite in the early stage of growing, it's easy to push data protection and data security to the back but there are also best practices for ensuring that you can stay compliant with the law while also building and running your businesses. So talk to the lawyers, talk to um, the data protection professionals um, in working with a lot of third party service providers, ensure that they as well stay compliant and just read up. There are lots of changes. Again, this is quite a nascent area and every day um, the regulators and the government come up with changes. And so echo what Fatima has said, ensure you read up, read up. A lot of opportunities are there and you will miss out on them if you don't stay up to date and you're not reading up on the changes that are taking place every day in the ecosystem. So what I'll say is try to stay compliant and ensure you read up on whatever existing knowledge you can find. Thank you. 
Thank you, precious. And last but not the least, Chidera. Thank you so much, Beverly, for hosting this. It's been really, really insightful. Um, thank you so much, Precious. Um, I'm hoping that you would reach out to the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau for more collaborations. Um, I say this because um, in my experience, we tend to deal with a lot of big businesses and we kind of forget about the SMEs. And we also like to take um, a collaborative um, approach when we're dealing with our stakeholders because we don't want to leave anybody behind and we don't want to make laws or regulations or policies, guidelines, frameworks without consulting everybody that needs to be consulted and understanding their peculiarities and finding innovative ways to you know, help small and medium enterprises to actually meet their business goals. So thank you so much for being here. And Fatima, thank you so much also for being here. Um, Nita is one of our, we call Nita our, our daddy, our daddy agency. And we're very proud of the work that Nita does. And we're very appreciative of all the support we receive from Nita. Um, especially when people mix us up, when people mix up NDPB and NIDA, we always get calls from NIDA saying this person called and they need them. So we're going to forward them to you. And so thank you so much for being here. And um, like Fatima and um, Precious have said, I think we're doing the best that we can to raise awareness. But um, I also need to say that we, I need to encourage everyone here to also be aware. So. If we're raising awareness, you also need to catch the awareness and you know keep in touch. Don't feel like you can't approach a government agency. We are here to serve, and you know, it is your rights. You literally, we're here because of you know you. So please feel free to reach out to us, send us an email, talk to the staff engage with us on social media. We're on Instagram, on all our Insta um, social media pages, just type NDPB. And I'm sure that you'll find us on every social media platform. If you, if you follow us, um, you will see posts. They are informative posts. We let people know what we are doing. We let people know um, opportunities that exist. Um, you basically have a window into what we are doing here at NDPB and you will be in a better position to take advantage of our services. So that's all I have to say. Thank you once again. Great. I have people asking for your presentation, quite a few people in the chat. So I think you're giving the go ahead. Okay, great. So um, for those of you uh, logged on and, and, to those, and to those who couldn't stay the whole duration, we will be sending the presentation of NDPB out because at the end of the day, there's nothing to hide. This is all about raising awareness, educating you and your clients. So just to say a huge thank you on behalf of Olisa Agwakoba Legal, uh, for joining us today. You took time from your busy, busy schedules to be with us, to learn, to engage, to network. We're really happy you uh, you, you spent time. Um, people are dropping their LinkedIn. I think it's a great time to drop in LinkedIn handles. Um, Precious has just dropped hers from Founder Institute. Please, please follow Founder Institute if you're not already following. They're doing such a great job in terms of startup education. You know, education is still going to, to transform society. That's the truth. Education is the foundation of innovation. Without education and awareness, you can't do much, honestly. So please make sure you connect with um, with uh, with Precious. Um, I, I would say if if my colleagues, if my colleagues, thank you so much. If my colleagues are on the on the um, call, kindly put um, our OAL handle as well. We also do a lot on startup education. Um, we believe we're big believers in collaboration. So we rely on our collaborators to learn about what they're doing and also try and 
put that into simple terms for for um for our for our clients and also the startup ecosystem who we serve as well so since nobody else is dropping in contacts i'll just close it out from here thank you so much okay that's it thank you emmanuel that's our our website um you can emmanuel you can also drop okay great all our all our handles are there our linkedin our instagram twitter you name it, it's all there. I, I, I do a lot of uh, networking. Networking has saved my life. <laughs> when you go for conferences, please be sure to talk to the people you meet because you never know where your next um, you know, partner, um, collaboration, or inspiration is coming from. So please follow the handles. Chidera of the NDPB has dropped hers. Fatima, I don't know if she's still on. Yes, she is. If you have time, you can drop your email if you if you if you want. If you don't have your LinkedIn, I really want to encourage all of us to 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 please connect, connect, connect. When you're connected, you're more likely to be more successful because you're less likely to to be unaware of changes. It is through my connections with my startup ecosystem, with regulators, with my legal industry, that myself and my team are able to really stay at the top, at the cutting edge of what's going on news. And you know what they say, um, knowledge is power, but it is truly the implementation of that knowledge that is the real source of empowerment. So thank you once again. It's been wonderful having my guests from the NDPB, from NITDA, and of course, from Founder Institute. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you can join us for more uh, of these webinar sessions. Chidera has just dropped the, the, the website link for the NDPB. Do follow them because you never know when the next window <laughs> will open for the next set of um, registration. So you never know; things could change. Stay at you, stay abreast. Keep, keep, keep. Stay connected. Stay abreast. And until next time, this is Beverly, your host. Take care. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here with us today. Thank you so much. And the recording, the recording of this webinar will also be made available on the OAL um, website as well. Thank you once oh. again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.